Women's Ways of Knowing. It was actually based in Vermont, so I thought that was really interesting that they did a very, um, and, and again, Women's Ways of Knowing is a very famous, important book, uh, and it was published in 1985. And I thought um, it's, it's interesting that certain things are really um, important. So here I'm also talking about my own learning. I mentioned one about trauma, but I also wanted to say how important it was to have the dialogical framework and how important it was for my participants uh, to know that I have been with them in their struggles. Um, so I would meet them at a certain time, let's say, um, when Omar Ska was written on her door, um, and Omar Ska is the name of concentration camp, uh, and, and that's something that people who have not been involved in this issue and have not uh, known what kind of struggles uh, s s survivors have gone through would have not been able to, uh, to, uh, to ask these kinds of questions. And those were the, the moments, I would say, that as oral historians say, and, and, and they are talking about insider and outsider, or well, it's the encounter that matters. Uh, so it's not necessarily this big new truth that we are finding out that only a researcher has, but it is the encounter between participants and the researcher itself in the process um, that brings the new uh, knowledge. Um, I, I would say that the other aspect of the oral history that spoke to me as a methodology here is the, this whole um, issue about inclusion and exclusion and the process of identities. Uh, so it's not necessarily that we can say, well, it happened in Bosnia, it could happen somewhere else, but it is really important uh, to, 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 to not only know the struggle, but it's really important to have a relationship uh, with that particular uh, issue that one is dealing with. Um, and, and there are also this, again, I have mentioned uh, this whole aspect of victimhood and survivorhood. Uh, there is some new research that is coming across in, in late 90s and earlier that are really walk, you know, walking away from that uh, division, uh, partially because, let's say, in Bosnia, it was so important for all the survivors to be involved in the advocacy as victims as well. They gain the status of civilian war victims. They uh, get the monthly pensions uh, from their state, from their government, which is absolutely unheard of in any other place. So this is not something that the international community or external forces have pressed for. It was also the use of media, uh, particularly one, another movie, uh, this was called Grbovica, um, that came even to Sundance. It, it won the Golden Bear in Berlin, but it was based exactly the stories were based on the experience of that particular movie that we have seen. And some of the survivors that we have seen in these documentaries were featured in this feature film that was made for general public. Uh, so, you know, so in a way, the use of media and, and cultural elements has been extremely important as an empowerment in, in this advocacy process. And then, again, the, the sense of agency extremely important. Uh, I, I also like to say uh, that my survivors really needed to know what my position was. Uh, so that, that's to say it in short, uh, not only that I have been there with their struggles, but in order for, to establish that type of encounter, uh, they, there was a clear call for a clarity of what's the position of the person who is so that, that's, that's again, I, I, they call it also is a new way of solidarity with the, with the participants, uh, but it's something that one can interpret differently. <coughs> I felt it as a closeness, really, as, as, as intimacy. And I'm ready for your questions. Yes. Not, not questions, but just reflections, <laughs> three things. Um, first of all, going back to the beginning, Pablo Freire, Right. Yes, yes. Of, of the whole conscientization. That's, yep. <laughs> that, that through, I mean, this is what you're doing yes, is a conscientization, yes. not, not only of the women in the, in the study, the oral history, but for everybody else, but right. it's through the, 
the recognition right. that right. one becomes strengthened. The, um, the second is just Carter Hayward, mm -hmm. who talks about bringing into speech. It's mm -hmm. when the moment when you bring something into speech mm -hmm. that, that it becomes, if you will, real. Mm -hmm. But it can dwell within, but it's that actual moment of birthing it into speech mm -hmm. that's so powerful. And then the very last thing, because I've done tons and tons of reading of feminist <laughs> theology, and, and um, it's the whole, the whole myth of objectivity. Right. The you know yeah. your human your hermeneutic of suspicion that yes. it's it's impossible to be objective because one always brings in the subjective because it's one's background that right. one brings into one's research. And the fact that you're choosing X instead of Y to research is affected as much. And I appreciate more and more in research that we we don't run away from that. That it is it becomes part of the research itself. You don't have to make yourself invisible. Um, I'd love to read this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a thumb drive. <laughs> Thank you. you. Thank you. Drive. Thank you, Reverend Lee. Well, well, of course, that I'm using a lot of errors, and then actually, that was, you know, whether what it was my theoretical framework, and some people didn't quite understand because most of the time, the adult learning and even is is really, you know, this organization that existed, they were. Um, more engaged in intervention. They were not necessarily <coughs> considering the learning component or educational component itself. Uh, so I, I think that the methodology that, that also deals with that and, and between oral history and, and um, adult and transformative learning, there is a lot of across, there is a pretty much dialogical framework. It's, it's the same concept. Uh, it's just in another discipline. So I, as a researcher and as a scholar, I had a lot of struggles. I had to uh, to decide not to go to a um, traditional CUNY place or any other place because they, they would have not, I was too heavy. <laughs> I had too many emotions. And I, I was not willing to run away from my emotions <coughs> in that aspect. Uh, so finding the theoretical framework that embodied that process, it was incredibly important to me. It, it, and it was quite a journey. Um, so I think that, no, it, it, I wanted to say something that, that Chris always wanted me, why are you not done? <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, I, 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 I wouldn't get there. <laughs> but it really takes sometimes, not very long time, but just to, to sort of things come together. In, in this kinds of research. And, and I don't blame anybody because it's really, really not, not, um, I say, not only not easy and rather difficult, but it's also sort of, it has to be a right moment in one's life. And again, I would have not done it if I didn't come to Vermont. <laughs> if I didn't have this wonderful, supportive community that let me be in peace. <laughs> and I'm saying New England witches. <laughs> hey. <laughs> because it did give me that sense of um, uh, freedom to explore these issues in the way how they spoke to me. And of course, my committee members were just wonderful. Um, you know, not what I'm saying. <laughs>